Welcome to everybody who made the trip out today. Uh, I just wanted to start off by saying we're really excited about the Orbital ATK-9 launch. The Cygnus is bringing with it over 3,000 kilograms of cargo to the International Space Station. Over 1,000 of those kilograms are on board to support the 50 science and technology demonstration experiments that we have and two new facilities flying to the ISS. Today we're going to be hearing about uh, at least four of those different areas of science and technology demonstration going on board. And uh, they range from uh, doing atomic physics and quantum mechanics studies to studying some of the distant galaxies uh, and X-ray emissions from those galaxies. The uh, presenters today are going to be covering topics uh, from the Cold Atom Laboratory, uh, the coldest man-made spot in the universe, and they'll be on to talk about some of those atomic physics and quantum physics um, topics. The uh, second presenters are going to be uh, talking about using surface tension to separate immiscible fluids in zero G, something that hasn't been tried before. Uh, we'll hear from folks who are doing uh, the mixing and solidification of cement on orbit, and we'll see what that has uh, happened to it when it's done in zero G. And finally, we'll be hearing about a trio of Earth observing satellites, CubeSats, that are going to be deployed from uh, the Nanorax CubeSat deployer and the GEM airlock. But first, I'll hand it over to my colleague from the National Lab and CASIS, who will talk more about those experiments. Thanks, Kurt. Um, so as Kurt said, we're super excited to be here. It's really pretty out here at Wallops, and uh, it's super exciting to see a rocket launch. I want to remind you guys that when that launch goes and you're saying, you know, go Antares, go Cygnus, say go science, too. Um, you're going to hear from scientists today who have spent uh, a lot of time, a lot of energy, blood, sweat, and tears getting their payloads ready for the spacecraft and to go to space. And uh, it, they're really, really excited too. They're gonna tell you all about their research. I'll tell you a little bit about uh, the ISS National Lab. First of all, the space station is an absolutely incredible place to do research. And these scientists that are sending their research to the space station uh, are super anxious to take advantage of some of the unique aspects of spaceflight, and that includes microgravity, it includes a vantage point with which to study the Earth, and also, not necessarily the case for, this, uh, ex for these experiments, but putting uh, experiments outside the space station to take advantage of a really, really harsh, extreme environment. So uh, NASA and the ISS National Lab work together uh, to basically open the door to researchers uh, all over the world, in NASA's case, and then for the ISS National Lab all over the United States, to put research on the space station. And uh, CASIS, the Center for the Advancement of Science and Space, with which whom I represent, we are privileged to be able to work with NASA in this capacity and provide access to the, re to the research community that includes academia uh, and student experiments. I believe we have over 20 student experiments launching. Um, it includes industry, and so you'll hear from Zyput Industries, as Kurt mentioned, the, uh, the continuous fluid flow uh, separation experiment, and then also other, other government agencies, such as the NIH and NSF. So again, we're super happy to be here. We'll be able to answer your questions later, and uh, I'll hand it back to Kurt um, to introduce our first science team. Thank you, Liz. So first up, I'd like to introduce the Cold Atom Lab team. Um, they're here today to talk about this new, unique facility on board the ISS and the amazing science that it's going to allow us to do for the first time. Uh, CAL, or the Cold Atom, Atom Laboratory, has been uh, in development for the last five years, and I'll be handing the mic over to Dr. Kamal Odiri uh, from JPL and Dr. Eric Cornell from NIST. Dr. Cornell received the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2001 for his co-discovery or uh, co-synthesis of the first B BEC Bose-Einstein condensate samples in the, uh, in the world. So thank you, uh, and here's the Cal team. 
Thank you, Kurt. We could have our first slide. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm very excited about the rocket launch and about the things that are going to happen there. And uh, could we click a slide forward? I can show you what's going on. I'm going to be talking about the Cold Atom Laboratory, CAL, we sometimes call it. Uh, and uh, of course, right there in the name is the word cold. We hope to get to, uh, in fact, there is CAL on its way getting loaded into, uh, loading into Cygnus. Uh, you can see it's on its way in. It gives you a feeling for about how big it is. Way down in the heart of that thing, and it's going to fly in the International Space Station. We hope to get to temperatures of about uh, something less than one nano Kelvin. So we intend to get to within one billionth of a degree of absolute zero. And I'm going to start right off by saying why, because why would you ever want to get that cold? And the answer has to do with, with really looking, if you look at the future, if you look at the trajectory of technology, of economics, uh, of the technology that drives the modern economy, it's easy to understand that the future is in the direction of the very, very small. Small transistors, small computers, uh, small nanobots. And at these very small scales, the physics, the science, the underlying thing that matters is called quantum physics or quantum mechanics. If you want to be able to design the technology that's going to underpin the economy of tomorrow, you not have to, you have to understand quantum mechanics not just at the level of that junior level class you took in college. You've got to really get it. You've got to grok it. You've got to feel it in your bones. You'd really like to be able basically to see the stuff. And it's true that quantum mechanics is the, is the science of the very, very small. But due to sort of a twist of fate, it's also the science of the extraordinarily cold. Getting extraordinarily cold has the effect of magnifying quantum mechanics up to the effect where you can see it. So you can actually see what amounts to waves of quantum matter a millimeter or two millimeters across. These things are called Bose-Einstein condensates. This idea, this sort of relevance, this connection between the very, very cold and the science which underpins the very small, which underpins the future of, of, of our economy, is not a new idea. In fact, there are hundreds of groups around the world here on Earth, including mine, which are studying this thing called Bose-Einstein condensation uh, with this idea in mind. But up in space, we hope to be able to get colder yet. Um, and how do we get this cold? Here on Earth, we use lasers, uh, which seems counterintuitive. Why would lasers make things cold? But they do, and then magnets to hold the atoms together and eventually let the hot buds pour out. And that's about, and we'll use that, all that same technology up in space. But in space, we can go one step uh, further. And this final step is, in some sense, a step backwards to your uh, high school chemistry class, where you may have learned that if you take a gas, and you let a gas expand, like you put it in a cylinder and you gradually expand the cylinder. The gas inside cools down. It's the ideal gas law. And so you might think, well, why don't we just do this on Earth? We hold the atoms in a little magnetic box here on Earth, and we try to open up the box. But here, under the influence of gravity on Earth, you open up the box and the atoms pour out. Up in space, effectively weightless, microgravity, we can continue to open up the box, actually turn it off, and let the atoms expand gradually, just hang there, to the point to where we get, to get the temperatures and durations of the experiment, which really aren't accessible here on Earth. We, get, we hope to get to a point well under a nano Kelvin, and we hope to be able to see condensates and then later do experiments in these things over clouds which might be one or two millimeters across. Something you could really, you know, we actually use microscopes and magnifying glasses and cameras to look at it, but in principle you could see with your bare eye. And therefore you get that kind of underlying intuition, which we think will be useful for uh, science and technology in the future. And my colleague Kamal, you want to OK, thank talk? you, Eric. Uh, as uh, Kurt said, uh, for being the first uh, you and your team to achieve Bose-Einstein condensate uh, you know, on Earth. And now we're very excited that we are providing you um, an opportunity to even go cooler uh, in, uh, and on ISS. So uh, what uh, Eric is holding is uh, this is the heart of the instrument. It's, it's a physics package. This is where um, actually we do all the, uh, we cool the atoms. And as uh, Eric mentioned, we apply lasers and, and precise uh, magnetic fields. Uh, and as the atoms are cooled when they reach maximum uh, uh, lower temperatures, actually we turn off the lasers and the magnetic uh, field and we allow 
gently for, for this cloud of atoms to just uh, expand, and this is, this is the precise moment when uh, Eric and other principal investigators start their uh, science. Uh, we're very excited because, like, the, the, can you, if you go back to the first uh, photo, uh, so called Atom Lab is a it's a multi-use um, user facility. It fits in about five lockers in the Express um, locker, and it will be installed by the, the two astronauts that we have, uh, uh, Drew and Scott. So th we've been working closely with them, and they're looking forward to. It will take uh, you know about. Uh, shift maximum to install it, and then we will be able to power up the instrument and start what we call commissioning phase to ensure that uh, you know, it meets all the science and within three months we hope to start returning the science. Uh, what's really important here, in addition to what Eric mentioned about quantum physics, the Cold Atom Laboratory also will give us some or, or better understanding as we use this um, cooled atoms to understand gravity. And th we have a few uh, principal investigators that they're going to specialize in that. And just I want to note some of the challenges, it was to uh, miniaturize uh, some of the key components. And one of them is with this uh, called Quanta, which is a spin-off from Colorado Bold uh, University Boulder. Yeah, and we, you, we yes. should mention that um, these, when these experiments are done on Earth, they're done in a typical university-sized laboratory, maybe 1,000 square feet. They're constantly tended to by three or four specialized scientists who sort of wait on them hand and foot. Uh, that's not available. The astronauts are busy, and space is at a premium, and especially weight is at a premium up there, and power consumption. So the, the challenge was to miniaturize all of this technology, which imagine filling up you know, the size of a fairly large room, that's into something which would fit in that box we saw up there, draw a reasonable amount of power, and then in order for us to take advantage of it, there will be cameras staring in at this, cameras staring in at the, at the place where the atoms at their very coldest, taking pictures of the atoms, recording everything that happens, beaming it down to the various different groups of scientists uh, and engineers who are working on it here on Earth. That's correct. And most importantly, we had to automate the process because mm. it will be operated remotely when in these laboratories, it relies about, uh, on the team of multiple uh, you know, scientists in real time. And just lastly, I would, it took like a, a multiple center, NASA centers to make this possible. So it was designed, built, uh, and delivered by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Um, uh, we have uh, science uh, slips and uh, at headquarters and ISS that have sponsored it and championed the idea. And of course, we'll work closely with Marshall uh, Space uh, flight center uh, f during the operation. So as you could see, it took a lot of uh, work and also collaborating with universities to make this happen. And we're really, really excited to give Eric and, and other principal investigators the, f the ideal instrument, we hope, uh, to reach colder temperatures. And thank the you for that. Thank, thank <laughs> you very much. All right, thank you both. Now we'll open it up for some questions. Again, if you're listening over the phone, press star one to be entered into the queue. And if you're watching on social media, use the hashtag AskNASA. Let's start in the room. Please raise your hand and wait for a microphone to come to you. regards to utilizing the technology for quantum computing and then superconductors, because I, I know that both of those devices utilize very, very cold temperatures, and the colder you get, the better they perform. So it's, it's true that actually one of the applications of Bose-Einstein condensation, which is not itself a quantum computer, it's like the working fluid, the freon that surrounds some quantum computers. This particular experiment doesn't aim directly at that. But it is an experiment that we'll look at, um, I didn't talk so much about, but the interaction between three or four atoms interacting in a quantum mechanical way. So we're really studying quantum mechanical wave functions with 10, 11, 12 degrees of freedom. And 12 should sound to you like a bite and a half. <laughs> so that's kind of the direction we're going, trying to let, reach towards the, the increased level of complexity that's associated with the hundreds and hundreds of bits you'd want to have uh, of quantum, quantum information in, in a quantum computer, but gradually. In this case, not quite that far. Do we have another question in the room, right here, second row? Um, 
microphone? Do you want to wait for the mic here? Because of your specific unbelievable history working with Bose-Einstein Bose condensates, how excited are you to get this instrument in microgravity? Extremely <laughs> excited, extremely excited. It's, it's been a very long time coming, and uh, I'm an impatient person, and, uh, and so yeah, I'm really looking forward to this. We will be uh, uh, probably like, you know, remember when you saw the Martian, like at JPL, they had like sort of a little mini version of the rover and things like that there. They have a little mini version of this at JPL, and we hope even as soon as uh, maybe next month to be going and trying out some of our ideas in gravity, which is not as good as in space, but like sort of getting ready for when the thing is fully commissioned, and we can get our virtual hands on it, <laughs> uh, which will probably, I think, maybe be sometime this fall. Okay. Right here, second row. So I understand that there are a few Nobel Prize winners at NIST. I think the last I heard count of was four. Is getting an experiment flown on the ISS something that you can rib the other Nobel Prize winners about, that you've achieved something more than yeah. them? Yeah, you probably don't know this, but the Nobel laureates go out, how they have drinking nights on Friday. And uh, you know, we talk about our golf games. And uh, this is going to be give me bragging rights. I think everyone else, everyone else should be buying drink, drinks. Yeah. Do we have any other questions in the room or on social media? Right here, second row. Hi, so I'm on space.com. Uh, what's the duration of the mission? How long will it last? And what kind of resolution can you get on your imaging? Okay. <clears throat> so the so the cold atom lab is expected to last three years um, from the start of the science. So that's what also some of the complexity that we had to deal with in the challenges because this is the first ever instrument that does this kind of science that is expected to last that long. In terms of the resolution, maybe uh, since, uh, since basically uh, the science on, on the cold atom lab is we take high resolution images. I, I, I think yeah. it's, it's roughly speaking, it's about uh, six microns to the pixel. But there's going to be a higher, there, there were, there's talk of an upgrade, which we're, we're working on now, or they're working on at JPL, which will have finer resolution. So you can see sort of a finer grade. But already at the existing uh, resolution, because these waves have gotten so large, it's plenty fine enough for us to see the detail we need to see. OK, we'll take one more question in the room. How dependent upon you are for, um, on the, is this experiment on consumables? Are you expecting to have to ship helium or something else up there to, to know it's all self-contained? It's, we can both it's funny when, when uh, people visit my, my Earth-based laboratory to see you know world's l record low temperatures and what have you, they expect to see bubbling fumes of cryogens, nitrogen and helium and everything. This particular technology, the only thing that's going to be cold is the atoms themselves. The glass, half a centimeter away, will be at room temperature, or as we like to call it, 300 Kelvin. So uh, <laughs> it's not actually surrounded by baths of liquid nitrogen, liquid helium. It's a different sort of technology. It consumes power. And when it's, uh, even when it's asleep, it uses 100 watts. And when it's fired up, it uses six, 700 watts. Yeah. But um, you know, they've, they've, you see those big sails on the ISS. That's what they're there for. And uh, it, uh, there's other, re other ISS resources that it, that it draws on. For instance, RF downlink, so we can talk back and forth. That There's bandwidth that we need. But uh, besides, other than that, it's just electricity. And we hope not too much of the astronaut's time. If it works as it's supposed to, it's just a little green flashing light on their console. But um, otherwise, who knows? They might have to do a repair job. Yeah, that's correct. Thank you guys so much, Kamal Thank and you. Eric. Thank you. Uh, we're looking forward to following the Cold Atom Laboratory okay. in you, orbit. Cole. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Andrea Adamo. He is going to tell us about his company, Zaput Flow Technologies, uh, launching innovative technology on Monday's launch. Thank you. So let me start providing some background on, the, on what we do and how this experiment came about. So there is an ongoing revolution in the way uh, I had that value molecules or drugs, pharmaceuticals, are produced.
So traditionally, people do batch synthesis. So what does it mean? You take a container, you put A, you put the, your two chemicals, you stir, you give it some heat, and you have a chemical transformation, a reaction, and this becomes another thing. And then through a series of process steps, eventually you get to your final molecule. So people are looking at different ways to do this, and they are thinking of continuous manufacturing. So instead of having things sit in a beaker, whether it's a small beaker or a production beaker, it's still a container, the idea is to have them react as they flow. So a flow-based process for continuous manufacturing. And there's a number of technical advantages over there that people are very interested in harvesting. So in the context of this processing, people often require to separate immiscible liquids, an oil and water type of, of situation in which these two things don't mix together. And you want to be able to take them apart. So traditionally, people do this with gravity. So you have a settling tank. The heavy phase goes to the bottom. The light phase goes to the top. You just have to wait and settling of cars. And that's how it's been done from probably 100 years or uh, ever since organic chemistry exists. But if you go in a continuous paradigm, how are you going to, to take care of this separation? It would be nice to have different tools that are actually are designed uh, to operate in a continuous way. And so this is what uh, my company, company I co-founded, Zypul Flow Technologies, is doing. And maybe the video uh, can, can show, uh, give you know, a sense of what we are doing and how. So if you see here, there's a device. You have a two-phase flow coming from the bottom left. You have water in red, and the clear liquid is uh, toluene in this case, an organic solvent. So it gets into the device and gets continually separated. So how do we do this? We leverage surface forces as opposed to gravity. So think of the nonstick pan you have at home. You know, it's a, the, the, the Teflon coating. When you put oil, the oil will spread, and the water will beat up. So this has to do with charge, the charges of the liquids and the charge of the surface. If they like each other, then the, oil, then the, the, the liquid will spread. And you say the liquid wets the surface. And if they don't like each other, it will beat up. And so that's exactly what we use inside. We have a Teflon membrane. And we have accurate control of pressures and conditions inside, so you can leverage this principle for uh, a continuous and selective separation that is actually scalable. So what you've seen in the device is a bigger brother of what's going to space. It will be used in pharmaceutical processing for so-called pilot plants, so when you make more material to test out. This is the device that we are sending to space. It's a smaller version. On Earth, it will be used for uh, laboratory applications. So uh, on the bottom, there's a separating membrane. And here, there's some uh, pressure control that we do in order to use this principle in a viable way. So what are we going to explore in space, and, and why, I guess, is the next question. So what? Uh, we'll explore separation. So we will test the device in, in a number of conditions, different flow rates, uh, different scenarios. And we'll benchmark what is happening in space with what is happening on the Earth and try to see if there's uh, something interesting that, that, that can be learned in order to improve this technology. So here we are doing essentially a fundamental paradigm shift in which people, in the way people have processed chemicals. So we're shifting from a gravity-based paradigm to a force, surface forces driven. And uh, the next question is why? So th there's two main reasons. One is to benefit what we do on Earth, and the other one is to look forward to activities in space. So I give you an example. So uh, we hope to learn uh, more about how this, this device works in order to make it better, uh, more performing, scale it up uh, um, even more than what we have already done. And so this would benefit Earth applications, hopefully pharmaceutical production. As far as space is concerned, if you think forward uh, in terms of Mars missions or exploration of deep, deep space, you need to have the capability of making uh, molecules. Uh, people are looking at 3D printing as a way to make parts, but you have to be able to make also material, whether it's a drug or another thing. You know, fuels could be an obvious example. And so you need chemical processing capabilities, and this, if it works in the way we hope, would enable certain steps in order to pave the way towards chemical synthesis in space. And of course, there's a very exciting horizon. So there's already a number of researchers that are looking at this, and we think this, it's an important contribution in the field. Um, 
So I, I, I hope this provides an overview of what we are doing, and I'd be happy to take questions. Yeah, uh, do we have, have any questions any. here in the room? Let's go in the back first. Hello. Um, uh, if I understood your experiment correctly, you separate uh, different um, fluids according to their polarity. Are there other methods you see or degrees of freedom where you can influence the, the chemical process that you want in the end to make? So as far as the separation is concerned, uh, you know, we do, we do rely on capillarity. So capilla capillary forces, um, you know, the capillarity phenomena scale with the, the diameter of the pore you're using. So we could use different membranes with different pore sizes to get different phenomena. But we already have, uh, at least for the time being, we have enough understanding there. So that is a parameter you would change to optimize for specific conditions. And as far as space is concerned, probably would be something interesting to explore in other missions. So what we are doing now is uh, explore one device first and see how it performs. And then we have another one that is modified internally to change the role different forces play. So surface forces are dominated by the length scale, or actually their relevance is dominated by the length scale. So we have a device with an internal geometry to try to downplay uh, that scenario. And on Earth, it actually doesn't really work that well. We, we want to see what happens in space. Right here, second row. Hi, um, Chelsea, space.com. Um, so just to clarify, um, you think that your, um, your fluid separating device when um, you know, improved and studied in microgravity and space could be then used to you know, be a basis for chemical synthesis and further down the line, potentially drug and pharmaceutical creation in space for long crewed missions? Yes, that's exactly okay, what I'm okay. thinking. Okay, <laughs> just yes. want to clarify. And that's exactly what I'm hoping, yes. Excellent, me too. <laughs> <laughs> right here, fourth row. So with the actual container being one of the reactants, what or how big is the problem with, I guess, resupplying the reactant when it actually is part of the container? Is that um, one of the pieces of the equation that you figure into the puzzle where, um, I guess, as it's reacting with the container itself, is this something which like wears away with time or is so, it continu yes. continually, I guess, forever as long as the device is operable? So uh, it's, it's a very good question. So there's uh, two scenarios. One is our experimental condition, and the other one would be if you were to perform uh, real chemistry in space. So uh, as far as we are concerned, we actually have, uh, we are recycling the liquids. So we have a supply of uh, water-like, a supply of oil-like, and we mix them together, as you've seen in, in the clip, and then we see how well this device separates them. And then they go back to the same uh, container they came up with from, and then we'll cycle through different scenarios. As far as chemistry space, you know, if you have a reagent, indeed, you would consume the reagent, but on the other side, you also get, get your product. So I guess that uh, hinges on a more general question of supplying things uh, in space. Uh, if you were able to make a, a wide variety of chemical transportations, ideally you can store on 10 substances and being able to make a thousand, actually. Because if you can play with chemical reactions, the number of molecules you can access is much more than the number of uh, molecules you have as a starting material. So uh, this doesn't necessarily answer your question of how you would store up but it, op it opens up possibilities in terms of uh, material you can actually access uh, if you can do chemistry in space. More questions? Uh, what is the rate of separation and how much volume will you be putting through the experiment? So in, in this case, the total volume that we have is about a liter, uh, divided in two bags of uh, half a liter each. Uh, this device, a small scale device actually, to see if it's working, uh, takes a very small amount uh, of material. So the internal volume is about half a m m milliliter. So you just have to wait to, uh, to be at steady state. So uh, one to two milliliters of material are enough to collect a data point. So there's a lot of data points that we can collect. Any other questions here in the room? 
Okay, thank you so much. Thank Andrea. you. Appreciate it. Our next two speakers are coming from Penn State University. We have Alexandra Radolinska, who's the principal investigator of the microgravity investigation of cement solidification, and also graduate researcher Juliana Neves. Thank you very much for having us here. It's a great pleasure to be here and present our work, which the title you heard is correct. It's cement solidification in space. And a lot of time when I'm asked what's the research when I do and I just say simply concrete, people give me a blank look and say they don't give PhD for concrete research. Well, yes, they do, because we are looking into colonizing space. We want to go to the moon and a deep space beyond, and we will need shelters for the human mission. We will need to protect the equipment from the radiation effects, from the, uh, any impact that could, this could experience, and we need to find a way to produce these shelters and produce a safe environment for humans or instruments to be in there. And it turns out that concrete is going to be our material to go. So our research will actually look into how cement reacts with water and how this very complex process of microstructure formation happens in space. So the process is actually fairly, fairly complex. We take it for granted and we take shortcuts when we talk about concrete, assuming that if you mix cement and water, they will solidify and will create stone-like material. The process has been fascinating scientists for the last 50 years. And for the last 50 years, despite the current technology and instrumentation that we have, we still don't understand the process completely. So we want to simplify the experiment by sending into space just cement and water that will be mixed on board an ISS and we will watch that complex microstructure formation that will be stopped and given time intervals and we will want to see what's the microstructure formation. On Earth, the process has been investigated but still has many questions remaining. So if we can make the process pure, because we know from protein research that the crystals will go larger and more, more ideal in its shape, if we can narrow down the amorphous phases and the crystal phases form in concrete, maybe we could, or cement, hardened cement paste, maybe we can improve the process on Earth. And when I teach materials classes, I always ask students, what's the most widely used material on Earth? And the answer is water. What's the second most widely used material on Earth? And that's concrete. For every person sitting in this room, there is one ton of concrete being produced and consumed every year. And every ton of concrete is responsible for emission of approximately 0.8 ton of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. We really need to understand much better what is happening with this material and how can you use it with more sustainable on Earth and how we can make a usage of raw materials present in the space and make a binder, concrete-like, cement-like binder in the space. So Juliana brought the experimental part that she will show this to you, the experiment, and Richard and Barry, who are partners of our project, are sitting in the back. So we will combine a small amount of cement and water, we'll burst the pouch, and after a certain amount of time, we'll flush the system with alcohol because the alcohol stops the process of hydration. So do you want to give it a try? So, so I'm going to do a live demo here. So this is how the uh, pouches are going to be launched. So we have here water, we have cement, and we have the alcohol. So the mic. for Hold the, the mic. real samples, sorry. For the real samples, uh, we have different compositions. So we can look at different um, crystals growing and different types of materials that forms. Uh, we can also take a closer look at um, dissolution and precipitation and also the entire hydration process. So if you can hold the microphone. All right, hope it works. So you see right now the, the, the burst, the, the pouch was, bur the burst CC was burst here and the astronauts will have a, a, a rubber spatula to mix it on a, on a table, so it's going to be a little easier to attain uniform microstructure. So what you're observing right now is cement being combined with water, and the hydration process starts. And actually, it's an exothermic process with a tiny small amount of heat being exhibited, but the chemistry behind what we are seeing right now is very, very complex. So we will see the solution of different species and the slow formation. The cement grains uh, first dissolve their out outer circumference, and then they st became stagnant for a little bit of time, and then there's certain um, concentration reached, critical concentration reached for the reaction to, keep to proceed, and 
and we want to stop these reactions and watch them when they occur in ideal space, which is gravity free. So this is the first stage of the mixing. So um, the sample is gonna sit on the ISS for three hours, seven hours, or 24 hours for the hydration process. So we can kind of track down um, how the microstructure develops over time. And um, after this um, time periods, we are gonna have um, to flush the sample with alcohol so we can uh, arrest hydration. And um, by the time that the samples return to Earth, we can just analyze the microstructure and compare to the Earth microstructural development. So that's the plan. So this is our demo samples. The, the real samples are properly labeled and we have a series of ground-based experiments we'll compare to the space-based experiments. And we are hoping for a breakthrough in a technology of cement and concrete, both on terrestrial and extraterrestrial spaces. Very interesting. Anyone have questions in the room? And of course, if you're watching on NASA TV, please use the hashtag AskNASA on social media. <coughs> Any questions here at Wallops? Yep, right here, front row. Um, can you talk about a little bit of the applications yep. that this might have on uh, in situ utilization resource uh, optimization on maybe the moon or the mo or sorry, sorry. My name is Josh. I'm from the orbital dot space. Can you talk about? Uh, the in situ resource utilization uh, applications this might have on the moon or on Mars or extraplanetary missions. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, we do. We, we have fairly good understanding by now what's the lunar regolith. And we have some samples of lunar regolith, which Juliana is already investigating. Turns out that the, the rocks or the aggregates that we can find of moon, they're fine. And if their fineness is, is adequate, they can actually be partially reactive. We also participated in a NASA challenge for the Centennial Challenge to create uh, shelters on Mars. And we were able to 3D print a binder that actually did not contain cement, but was purely using uh, um, materials present on Mars. And these indigenous species had to be activated by alkali solutions. But potentially, that would be a small component that needs to be taken from the Earth. And we could utilize natural resources, natural rocks, and soils available in extraterrestrial space. Right here, in the back middle. Patrick Hedrickson, HighCamera.com. I was wondering, will concrete set up in the vacuum of space? That's a very good question. Will concrete set up? And, and the even more interesting question is what's going to happen to that moisture that is being present? Because there is a lo lot of loose water that is present that's going to be taken away by vacuum. So when we think about processing of these materials, they would be 3D printed, and they most likely would, would be 3D printed under these large domes that would be set up for the construction processes. So we do have an opportunity, and Richard is here in the room, we can talk maybe afterwards. Uh, we do have an opportunity potentially to send some ready samples and see how much damage would occur with the rapid radiation and the vacuum present. And we know there will be negative effects, but we will hopefully be close soon to answer, to give you the answer that is, that is science-based and merit-based on that. So my question is, you're dealing with mainly mixing the concrete in space, but how do you plan on forming the concrete? Because on Earth, when we pour concrete, we put up forms, and then you pour the concrete for the structure that you're, you're um, using it for. So what are your plans on overcoming the obstacle of a free-flowing liquid in space when you have to have it set up in a proper configuration? Thanks for the question. Um, so um, this research is just the first step. It's We are much before this. We didn't reach there yet. Um, but as Dr. Radlinska was explaining, everything might be 3D printed. So we are developing this technology on Earth. And it's going to probably be uh, applicable to um, space construction. We have another question in the room, and then we'll go to social media. So how are you planning to observe the chemical reactions at the ISS? Are you, the astronauts going to be taking pictures? Are they going to be doing chemical analysis on the sample? So very good question, thank you. Um, so that's the purpose of the alcohol. With a f alcohol flush, we are able to arrest hydration. And that's why we are going to arrest hydration over time. So we have 120 samples that are going to be arrested. So we have this cement here that is going to be stopped at three hours 
the, the other identical sample is going to be stopped at seven hours and so on and so forth. So by the time the samples return to Earth, we are going to compare the microstructure of the sample that was mixed on Earth to the one that was mixed on space, in space, sorry. Did I our answer your question? Okay. Our next question is from social media. Twitter user Mac asks, will the experiment be done in pouches while spinning to simulate gravity? We, we have actually another ongoing um, in-work progress. We would want to spin the samples because when we talk about the space, the deeper space, we don't have just the one type of gravity or lack of gravity. As we move to different planets, we've got different gravitational settings. So we would be actually want to, we would be willing to and, and planning to do some centrifuge experiments as well. But this is our first step to understand how hydration will be affected by lack of gravity. That will give us some scientific answer, and then we'll plan our experiments judiciously based on the findings of the first step. Thank you for the question. Any other questions here in the room? OK, thank you both very much. Thank you very much. Cygnus will also be carrying some small satellites about the size of a cereal box uh, on this launch to test future Earth observing technologies. Uh, these small satellites provide a low cost pathway to technology demonstrations and scientific investigations. We have three Earth Science CubeSat representatives to tell us about the, some of them launching. Joel Johnson from Ohio State University is the principal investigator of QBERT. We have Professor V. Chandra from Colorado State University who works on the Temporal Experiment for Storms and Tropical Systems demonstration. And finally, we have Ava Perel from Jet Propulsion Laboratory who's the principal investigator of RainCube. Joel's gonna get us started and then you'll hear from Chandra and Ava. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks welcome. for the chance to talk to you about our project, the Cubert mission. Um, Cubert stands for CubeSat Radiometer RFI Technology Validation Mission. <laughs> kind of a long name, a mouthful there. So let me try to explain what each piece of that means a little bit here. The first part is CubeSat. So all three of us up here are, are, have projects that are based on the use of small satellites called CubeSats. And actually over there in the side of the room, there's an example, a model of a CubeSat. Um, that, that's uh, another CubeSat that's on this launch called HaloSat. That one's not Cubert in particular. But uh, from looking at the model there, you can see sort of the size of satellite we're talking about, about the size of a shoebox or so. Um, all three of our, uh, of our CubeSats will be going along on the launch on Monday up to the ISS. And uh, from the ISS, we uh, later in the summer get pushed out into orbit, into free flying orbit uh, by a company system called Netarax that's on board the ISS. So then our CubeSats operate uh, independently in, in space. Uh, all three of these projects are Earth observing missions. So in particular, Cubert, it's CubeSat, the next word is radiometer. So Cubert is a, a radiometer, which means a sensor that tries to measure the amount of power coming in the electromagnetic spectrum coming from Earth. And in particular for Cubert, it's a uh, microwave radiometer. So the part of the electromagnetic spectrum we're looking at is in the microwave region for us between six and 40 gigahertz. Um, the reason for doing that is because uh, Earth produces natural emissions in those frequency range. And uh, those emissions, it turns out, can be used for measuring a lot of different properties of the Earth, including properties of the atmosphere, like the water vapor in the atmosphere, uh, things like the temperature of the sea surface, things like ice coverage in the Arctic. There's a lot of different applications for trying to measure the natural noise coming from Earth in those frequency bands. And there's a, a number of satellites measuring those emissions for those kind of applications. Those satellites have been operating for decades, and they're important parts of uh, monitoring Earth's Earth's uh, weather, Earth's environment, trying to do Earth science. So they're important sensors uh, for trying to uh, observe our planet. So CubeSat radiometer, the next uh, part is radio frequency interference. So I, there was a slide, if I could have that slide back there. Um, this slide shows some examples of those kind of measurements. So from, from uh, radiometer in space at the moment, this is in particular from the uh, 
Global Precipitation Measurement Mission has a radiometer in this band, these sorts of frequencies looking at Earth. And you can see some of the natural thermal emissions that are coming from Earth. But you also see these red kind of blotches there. And it turns out those red blotches are not Earth's natural thermal emissions. Those are uh, man-made transmissions. Because it turns out this part of the frequency range between 6 and 40 gigahertz is not just useful for measuring uh, natural noise coming from Earth. It's also very useful for doing things like wireless communications and radar sensing and a lot of different other applications. And as we all know, the demand for those kind of services just keeps getting higher and higher and higher. So as that happens, there's more and more competition between uh, people who want to use the spectrum for transmitting information and uh, scientists who want to measure Earth's natural thermal emissions to, uh, to measure properties of the Earth. So from Qbert's point of view, the man-made transmissions are interference. So that's why it's radio frequency interference. Ra we were measuring at radio frequencies. So, um, so this is a problem for, uh, for microwave radiometers trying to observe Earth. And you know, as the demand for the spectrum gets higher and higher, it's harder and harder to keep doing these important scientific measurements. So the last part of Qbert's name is technology validation. So Qbert is all about uh, a new kind of processor to attach to a microwave radiometer so that it can uh, still continue to measure the natural thermal emissions even in the presence of someone else or other signals that are coming from Earth that are man-made. And uh, so this, we built a new processor that's a very capable processor. Um, it's it's be the first time a processor like this has been used in space. And the goal of Qbert really is to demonstrate the success of that processor so that it could be used in uh, future radiometer missions as they continue to uh, be used in the future and you know, really help address this problem of the competition between the science uses of the spectrum and the uh, other uh, uses of the spectrum. So we have a couple pictures here. There's a picture of the Qbert CubeSat uh, in its stowed position. That uh, hash thing at the bottom is the payload antenna, again measuring between 6 and 40 gigahertz. There it is turned on its side with the antenna deployed and the solar panels deployed. And uh, there's a picture here of our Qbert team. Qbert's uh, you know, a project that involved a lot of participants. Um, the, you know, I'm from the Ohio State University, so I'm, I'm the Qbert PI. But we also have uh, team members from NASA JPL, NASA Goddard, Blue Canyon Technologies provided our spacecraft bus. They're, they're, they've done a great job with that. Um, and also, we want I think all three of our projects here will want to thank the Earth Science Technology Office of uh, NASA that's funded these, these uh, programs. So I'll hand it off next to Professor Chandrasekhar. He's going to talk about Tim. Thank you. He's done a lot of the setup and uh, also a lot of the tanks. So that gives me more time to <laughs> talk about the problem. Like me, many of you drove in last night. I am sure, like me, many of you went through this high water crossing. There were a lot of signs. <laughs> And like me, I think a lot of you tried to outsmart the forecast <laughs> and outsmart the storms, and we couldn't. And I, I think I can outsmart. It never works. So this is a perpetual problem because we still need to observe these storms with very high temporal and spatial scales. And in spite of all this, was all the time from Mark Twain, what he said, we still don't know exactly when the cloud forms and when it rains. And we need to observe these storms as a function of time at one space. We know how to do that from geostationary orbit. But that's all a lot of visible and infrared measurements. And if we have to look at them with microwave where you penetrate deeply, you need uh, microwave measurements and radars and so on. So that's the challenge we are taking on, which is looking Tempest, which is, uh, I had a title there, which is Tempest stands for Temporal Observation of Storms and then Tropical Systems. So temporal is the key thing here to look at a time resolved. So a lot of us have seen, uh, I'm used to work with big radars, and as you have driven outside, uh, you see huge antennas. And actually, I have personally worked with uh, one of those radars called Spandor big radars. But then when you start getting into the small measurements, then they said you have to make it really small if you want to continuously observe it. One way to continuously observe it is launch a whole bunch of these things so that on that place, they just come take turns and observe. So we all take turns to observe these things. So if you are to take turns to observe these things, we need to make a lot more of these. Then a lot more of these means they have to be smaller, cheaper <laughs> in small serial box. 
Everything was fine until somebody told us it's serial box size because I'm used to working with radar antennas that are football size field. <laughs> and then they said, you got to put it in that. First time I went, what? <laughs> so a lot of the development in Tempest D technology is um, like uh, Professor Johnson said, uh, this is uh, radiometric measurements, which is you observe the atmosphere and then try to predict precipitation at multiple frequencies using radiometers. As a good segue, the next speaker will speak about radars. So we put multiple of satellites. And the way to, for you to imagine this is uh, we have to do orbit maneuvering, how to position them. A lot of you imagine, that. Like, have you seen, anybody has observed uh, people putting this uh, traffic cones with a moving car? There is a person, as the thing moves, just keep on dropping traffic cones. It's all perfect. Just like that, we want to position satellites. And you can see here a bunch of satellites. And uh, there are 6U, which is uh, 10 by 22 by 33. And then they, will, they are making measurements at the frequencies from 89 to 182 gigahertz. So this whole project is about developing all the technology that what we used to do from huge systems into shoebox size. And, uh, and this is where the, the setup is, the satellite. Just like uh, Professor Johnson showed, this is uh, at the desktop with the, the solar panels pulled out. And then this is what we think it's going to look like when it flies. With that, I will give it to. Um, so uh, I'm working on RainCube. I'm the principal investigator of RainCube. RainCube is like a sister mission to Tempest, very similar science objectives. The main difference is that Tempest D is using radiometers, RainCube is using a radar. So RainCube stands for radar in a CubeSat. And it's just that, it's a radar in a 6U CubeSat, and as the name also says, it measures rain. You can see there a picture of the, of the actual instrument that we're going to be flying with the antenna uh, deployed. So, uh, uh, we, we, we believe that RainCube is going to be the first active instrument in a CubeSat. So CubeSats have been around for a long time. So why, what was the challenge about uh, putting a radar in a CubeSat? Uh, radars are notorious for being very large, very power hungry instruments. Uh, so a, a, J, a group of JPL engineers developed a new architecture for radars and we were able to reduce the size, mass, and power consumption of the radar by about an order of magnitude, a factor of 10. So you can see here, just to give you a perspective of how small RainCube is, we're comparing CloudSat radar, which is a radar that very similar to RainCube. It was uh, launched about uh, 12 years ago and compared to RainCube. So on the left, all of those blue boxes on the left fit on the little uh, blue area on the right. Uh, as you might know, uh, CubeSat volume is measured in a unit called U. It's a square of 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters. So as you can see, the CloudSat radar is about uh, 200 U. The RainCube radar is only 2.5 U. So it's almost 100 of, uh, times uh, smaller than uh, CloudSat. So significant advancement in the technology. Uh, uh, it's true that RainCube doesn't do everything that CloudSat can do. CloudSat, as the name says, measures clouds. Cloud particles are very, very small. RainCube cannot do that. Uh, we can only measure rain droplets. Uh, so if we had the technology to measure clouds 10 years ago, why are we investing in RainCube? Uh, same as Tempest, the strength is really in the numbers. Uh, we can only send one instrument such as CloudSat every many years. Whereas with RainCube, we expect that we could send a constellation of these little CubeSats, and then we could measure uh, very frequent temporal and spatial observations of precipitation. So there's two main mission scenarios that we envision for RainCube. The first one is just that, sending uh, multiple radars in uh, multiple optical planes and uh, just have a very frequent observations of precipitation. The second one, actually, something that is what got uh, many scientists extremely uh, motivated about RainCube, uh, it is launching a train of satellites so that we can actually observe uh, the structure of uh, the internal structure of the, of the clouds uh, as they vary in time. Uh, radiometers usually take a picture of the top of the clouds 
uh, radars actually penetrate the cloud and they give you a profile of the precipitation inside the cloud. They measure the reflectivity of those particles. Uh, this uh, reflectivity is measured in this very strange unit that scientists invite, invented that is called DBC. So you can see that if we had uh, uh, many of these uh, CubeSats, they could follow, the, they could observe this cloud as it is evolving, and they could take the snapshots of the cloud, of the reflectivity of the cloud inside the cloud as it evolves in time. But RainCube, it's not only about the radar instrument, we're also demonstrating a new antenna development. It's a parabolic antenna, a K-band antenna. It's about half a meter uh, size, and if you can start playing the video, um, uh, it's, uh, uh, it fits into a 1.5 U volume. It stows like an umbrella, and it has a, a motorized deployment. It goes very slowly. This is uh, four times the speed, so it actually takes about three minutes to go up the, the, the canister. This is actually the, 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 the deployment in the actual CubeSat uh, right before we stored it uh, for launch to send it to Nanoracks. So it goes up, as you see, and then at the end, you'll see now that the rips are spring-loaded. So they're going to open up very quickly. Uh, so now we're going to go real time, and then we go into slow motion. So that you can see how the rips open up, and then um, in the, uh, uh, this antenna, as it is a parabolic reflector, it has a sub-reflector. So first, uh, the uh, rips, very close to now, we're going to go into slow motion. You'll see how uh, the rips will start opening up. And then in the end, the sub-reflector is going to be, uh, it's going to pop out. When the umbrella finally settles, then the sub-reflector is going to be popping out. So this antenna is not only useful for radars, uh, it has many other applications beyond radar. So it can actually used for com it can, it can be used for communications uh, to significantly increase the speed of uh, communications in space. So we want to have an independent validation that the radar uh, that the antenna uh, deployment was successful. So we uh, we have a camera in the in the CubeSat so that we can observe that we can actually see on the ground that the antenna was deployed. And if you can play that video now, you'll see this is a very different video. It doesn't look as good as the previous one, but we will be able to take those captures of the, of the antenna as it deploys, and then we'll see that the ribs have deployed and that the sub-reflectors have deployed. Uh, so in summary, we're very excited about this mission. Uh, we believe that uh, uh, it's right now it's a technology demonstration that it's, uh, it's successful. Uh, Soon we'll see constellations of these small radars together with radiometers, uh, which will significantly improve uh, weather and climate forecasting and our understanding of the water cycle. Okay, now we'll take some questions. If you have someone in mind who you want to answer your question, please direct it to them. And if not, we can figure out who's the best person to answer that. Do you have any questions in the room? Start here. What's your, are you looking at on-ramps to move this technology out of R&D and into commercial use? You've already got um, a number of small sat companies deploying um, various tools to gather, to generate data commercially. And it sounds like there's both on-ramps in, uh, in terms of the types of satellites and instruments you're building, but also more generally um, moving the uh, antennas um, out into uh, 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 general use for, for CubeSats? Yeah, so at JPL, we're actively involved in uh, uh, re uh, releasing this technology to industry. The antenna, we already have a partner we're working with that is going that has a license to build this antenna. Uh, same thing for the radar. If the radar was successful, we would partner with uh, commercial vendors uh, to uh, uh, build these constellations of radars. Other questions in the room? So I think that this is for anybody who wants to answer it. It's not directed to any one of you, but one of the first images that we saw was, I guess, um, like this, the spectral images of human activity on the planet. So does this technology have the possibility to, I guess, forecast our influence in being co-creators of the weather? Because as we know, we have things such as the lake effect. 
which influences the weather drastically. But will it be commonly known like as the city effect in the future, as cities themselves become things which can drastically influence the weather and the atmosphere? Uh, I would say that wasn't our first goal for this project. Um, you know, Cubert, for our particular project, Cubert will be observing Earth emissions between 6 and 40 gigahertz. Now, we observe that a single gigahertz at a time, so the instrument can tune. It will take us a while, and you know, we have about a one-year mission life. During that time, we do expect to produce some uh, images of different parts of the spectrum, so we will have some of that kind of information. You know, there are other parts of the spectrum that may be more indicative of the kind of activity you're talking about. For example, these uh, maps of how the Earth is lighted uh, at different periods of time and so on. But uh, it's an interesting idea. Next, we have a question from social media. On Twitter, um, user Lee asks, could this CubeSat research lead to earlier warnings for catastrophic storms? Sorry. Is it, uh, the, will your CubeSat help early detection of significant storms? Oh, so definitely yes. Like I said, um, the, the key aspect of it is uh, temporal variability. So we want to observe all the way from formation of clouds to formation of precipitation. And then it was also shown that finally this will also get into models, which gets further into forecasting. And the reason why we want to get into the satellite scale is because uh, then we can get into these things at the models at a global scale. So the short answer is yes. Any add? other questions here in the room? Hi, my question is about Qbert. Uh, the microwaves are my favorite. Can you talk a little bit more about the specific type of antenna that you're using? And you also talked about you're looking at one gigahertz uh, at a time and how you're gonna be doing that. Okay, sure. Um, so one thing about Qbert that's a little different from the other two projects is um, the, we're observing at lower frequencies than a, either a Tempest or a RainCube. And uh, one thing about using lower frequencies is you really need a big antenna to be able to have good uh, resolving power on the Earth. And you may have noticed Qbert doesn't have a big antenna. And that's because Qbert's goal is to demonstrate this processor for separating the thermal emissions from the man-made transmissions more so than it is trying to you know, have a high resolution image on the Earth. So Qbert has only a small antenna but the small antenna is good enough for us to accomplish what we need to do to demonstrate this processor. Um, and the, the second part of your question was about... Um, How you're looking at just the, you said one gigahertz frequencies right. at a time? Yes, yes. So, um, so in this range of frequencies, again, six to 40 gigahertz or so, there are multiple radiometers currently in orbit observing Earth. And those radiometers typically have a set of, say, five or six frequencies that they use. And each, each one of those that they use is about a gigahertz, around a gigahertz wide. So Qbert's goal is to really focus on those bands that the radiometers in orbit use right now. And that's why we set our, our little piece we can look at at one time about the same size as that. But actually, we can tune anywhere in that range so that we can also look at other bands that aren't currently used to see if they might be useful for, for Earth observations in the future. So hope that answers your question. Do we have any other questions? Okay, thank you all very much. Thank you. So with that, we will end our show. Thank you again to all of our speakers, everyone who's here at Wallops to see a rocket launch and everyone who tuned in on NASA TV and online. Uh, be sure to check out live launch coverage starting Monday at four o'clock a.m. Eastern time. You can also learn more about this launch at nasa.gov slash orbital ATK, and you can follow along with these research experiments and more at nasa.gov slash station. That's it.